I was perfectly happy to do the dinosaurs, the technique that Phil Tippett had honed to a fine point. And we had settled on that for Jurassic Park. Personally, I didn't think the CG was ready to do Jurassic Park, for at least for the close-ups of the dinosaurs. I thought maybe we could do like some stampede sequences, because what computers are good at is, like in word processor, you could clone something a million times. You can copy a word and, and duplicate it a hundred times on the page or anything you want. Well, it's true also with models, and so you could do it with dinosaurs. You could make one Gallimimus dinosaur and, and clone 20 of them and have them all running with the same run cycle. That's the sort of thing that's really hard to do with stop motion or anything like that. But we started doing these tests in CG before the show was going on, and our tests started looking better and better. Until one day, Dennis Murin came over to me and said, you know, I really think we should do this in the computer, and let me shoot a test and show you. Dennis was working off in the corner. We were going along the normal route. Dennis then got the the audience with Stephen, and part of it is to convince Stephen, and part of it was me saying, we can do this, I will guarantee it, it'll be fabulous. The test was a herd of running gallimimuses, and he didn't flesh them out, he just basically uh, put the bones in motion. It didn't have that kind of artificial look, it was completely realistic, it looked like skeletons had come to life and were just running throughout Hawaii and all the onus of stop-motion photography was suddenly eradicated. We were both kind of wondrous about what this was promising, this industry. We literally didn't know from one day to another how stuff was gonna look. Every day we'd be looking at the dailies and saying, did we do this? Did people make these images? We've never seen anything like this before, you know? Where's the trickery we've been seeing in movies for, you know, 80 years? There's nothing there, it looks real. A visual effects shot starts with a line in the script that describes something. Let's say a, a dinosaur runs across the field. You start by going on the live action set and shooting what's called a plate. The plate is the background that you're ultimately going to insert that digital character in this example. The plate comes back to the artist. They create a virtual topography that reflects what they've seen in that shot. They build a character in the computer. They build its bones, they build its structure, they then come up with surfaces and skins for it. They color it, they give it eyes, they give it motion, they give it fingernails. They rig it so that it can be animated. So they take that photograph background plate, they take that character, and they animate the character in the computer space to fit into that photographic plate. When that's done to the director's satisfaction, they actually composite it into the scene. Once it's composited into the scene, it is filmed out of the computer and cut into the film, and hopefully everybody loves it in the movie house. Here, there was not even going to be a thought in the audience's mind that what they were seeing was not absolutely real. And because Stan Winston did, some, did this amazing job of creating full-size life replicas of a T-Rex, we were able to effortlessly cut together the digital dinosaurs with the Stan Winston full-size dinosaurs, and the audience sometimes was confused as to which was which. The major breakthrough really was when Steve bought off on the idea of making that leap from analog to digital. And that really is what changed everything. Once we did those dinosaurs, I saw that we had unlimited possibilities. From the point of view of the industry, the turning point was Jurassic Park. When Jurassic Park happened, then that was like this big switch was thrown. It's like the world has changed. It started a kind of a revolution and an evolution that began to move faster than the speed of light. It's, it's a dinosaur. I was amazed at how much ILM was able to accomplish and go beyond the dinosaurs with everything else they did in the next several years. Transferring the culture from an analog culture to a digital culture was huge. Huge problem. Lots of pain, lots of heartache, lots of emotions for people who were, you know, getting crunched in the shift. 
It caused concern for the people who were used to doing traditional effects. You know, would their jobs become obsolete someday? When I started working in computer graphics training, they referred to me as going to work for the dark side. The model shop were threatened by this, by this whole division that was growing up. And I was one of the few people who made the first jump into CG from the model shop. Since then, been many, and we've all been most, on the whole, been very successful. But at first, it was not considered to be loyal to the shop. I had an interesting experience where where we'd had a shot in the movie that was just really bad. It was an optical composite. And we redid that comp with, with some frustration, and people didn't want to do it, with digital, with Photoshop, and it's like night and day. So I showed this to one of the old-timer optical guys who had done it the first time, showed him both versions, and I said, which one do you like? Because I wanted to bring him into the digital world, and he, liked, he picked the old one. And I thought, what the heck are you seeing? What's going on? And, and I realized then there was a problem here. You know, there's fear going on, denial is going on. But he ended up being one of our best digital compers once he came over to it and saw what he could do. Right around the same time, Bob Zemeckis did Forrest Gump. And Forrest Gump had a similar importance in terms of changing the industry. What Jurassic Park did in terms of big in-your-face visual effects, big characters, uh, bringing fantasy and sci-fi to the foreground, um, Forrest Gump did in exactly the opposite and understated way. Invisible effects, doing things that you couldn't do before, changing people's performances by changing the way their lips move, changing the skies and pictures to create a different mood. All kinds of little things that, had you been able to photograph it that way originally, it, you would have, but you couldn't, so you manipulated everything to enhance the storytelling. At one point in Forrest Gump, he's playing ping pong, and he's playing at this phenomenal speed. You might ask, how did Tom Hanks learn how to play ping pong? Well, the answer is, of course, is he, he doesn't. He's just moving the paddle, and somebody's putting the ball in, and it's, it's used with with Renderman. So it's a simple little thing, but what it meant was a story point would go into a movie and the audience doesn't know or care about it. And we reached that point where it's not about special effects anymore, it's about telling the story. So suddenly visual effects has a place in, in dramatic films and comedies, all types of things that it just didn't fit into before. And at that point in time, everybody started to try to figure out uh, how to dust off those old scripts they had that they didn't know how to make before. As ILM approached their 100th movie, they would be challenged with the next level of realism. There was the beginning of kind of working with CG creatures. Because uh, I remember at one point there was a wall blew open and then a guy came through. He's the rhino. Okay. And I said, run away from the rhino. And that was the beginning of kind of, okay, imagine now that's the rhino, the one, the one on the right is an elephant. Phil is the hippopotamus. Okay, good. Okay, I got it. Let's do this. Run! It's a stampede! Basically, it's just fight or flight. Most of the time, you're just running. It's not a creature that's, you know, having a dialogue. It's nothing that's talking to you. It's basically chasing you or confronting you or running from you or you're both in a state of fear. I was amazed by all the larger creatures who are insanely beautiful. And I found out that they had taken some of the programs from Jurassic Park and applied them to elephants and rhinos. And they're working you through going, you can't go there, you have to look over there. And they're going, literally, this area is a no-go. Especially if you're thinking, well, can I run over there? No. Why? That's a pit. Okay, cool. It's a twister! It's a twister! The tornado in Wizard of Oz, to me, just stood out as being strikingly real compared to other stuff I'd seen. Uh, it was beautiful also to look at. It had this, I'd never seen that done before, and I don't think it's ever even been done since as well with that sort of beautiful cylindrical design. ILM is consistently breaking new ground. I think that the visual effects industry requires that. Twister, I remember, got green lit because of a special effects shot that ILM did, and we did a test, and we sat in the screening room at Amblin. Everybody loved the shot so much that that's when the movie got green lit at that moment. 